Are you guys, uh, I'm Pastor Corey, by the way. This is the Pastor Aaron. You're welcome to laugh in church. And uh, yeah, we'd love to meet you afterwards as well. We'll give you some um, steps with our hosting team at the end to help connect you a little bit more in this church family. All right, um, I'm going to put up uh, 2 Timothy. We're in a series about Nehemiah. Um, but we're going to read from uh, the book that Paul wrote to Timothy right now by the Holy Spirit. And uh, read this after me. Uh, read this with me, not after me. For the time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Scratch your neighbor's ears and say, today is the last day of itchy ears. You're going to love it. All right. Um, I just want to do a huge uh, shout out to our team, uh, to Pastor Aaron, who started Venue Kids um, uh, from scratch, and her team, uh, for Tammy, for Arwen, who did so much work, for every person here. Um, I want to I wanna thank every person who came here and worked here, uh, who took vacation days to do it, who took time off work. We understand that it cost you, but what an incredible investment. Um, I was here at the, like, the moment where it's like, do you want to follow Jesus? Hoffer, how was your time uh, here? <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You can ask him how it was. I don't want to get into it, but Ryan was a, a trooper when he was here. Um, then he did not feel called to come back the next day. Um, when you're dealing with like 120 boys, there was like 255 uh, kids here, right? And so incredible. Um, also, I... Um, this is super cool, is that they were raising money. We, um, we built houses in El Salvador with Shelter Helps, and the kids raised uh, $1,350. So they went home. This is what we heard, is that some of them went home, and they're like, Mom, we need to do some chores, but we don't want, like, we want the big money, Mom. Like, we're building houses in El Salvador. Trot out the big, the big bills, Mom. Um, and so $1,350, one of our venue team members matched it, and another uh, venue team member filled the rest of it up so that, that from, from day camps, we're building a home in, uh, for a family in El Salvador. So great job training your kids, and thank you if you gave towards that. That's so awesome. Also, um, August the 7th is First Wednesday. We're going to do a First Wednesday in August, and so this is a night that maybe some of you have never gone to. Uh, that it's really behind the scenes. Um, we have worship, prayer. We can minister a little more um, than we can do on a Sunday morning. And so uh, there's going to really be a behind the scenes um, talk that I'm going to give there that's kind of a prophetic word for where the church is going. So don't miss that. I think in the summertime, um, like you're here, but you know, I get it. We're on vacation. But um, we, we get a little distant from God sometimes, and distance from God and his family can create distortion. And uh, distortion is kind of creates that uh, disconnect, and uh, God really wants to connect you. I think first Wednesday, put it on your calendar, um, the first Wednesday of the month, 7 o'clock here at the church. And there's child care, uh, which I forgot to mention in the other service. So, Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, who knows who Liverpool Football Club is? Who cheers for Liverpool Football Club? Who cheers for another team that they shouldn't? Boo. Okay. Um, I'm a huge Liverpool football. It's soccer. Uh, yeah. Football club. It's called football in the rest of the world. Are we, am I having to re-educate the Canadian population? Come on, you guys start laughing or the sermon's going to take forever. Um, so we had a, a manager of Liverpool Football Club named Jurgen Klopp, who was from Germany, who was a born-again Christian and one of the most admired figures in football. And, um, and he was a, like a, you know, a, it, he was a, an incredible manager. He managed our club for, I think, nine years or something. And so, but he was great. He was like everybody on the club's dad. He was incredible. Um, and uh, John Oliver, you guys know who John Oliver is? Yeah. You're allowed to speak up in church a little bit. I know you watch TV. So John Oliver, who's kind of a comedian guy, who's absolutely hilarious. He's a huge Liverpool fan. And I watched an interview um, where he's getting interviewed about this whole manager, because Liverpool manager, Jurgen Klopp, stepped down this year. He wants to enjoy his life um, or something like that. And so he's been incredible, but it was a huge shock to the club. And so John Oliver is a huge Liverpool fan. And when, when Jurgen Klopp stepped down, uh, he was asked in an interview, like, how do you feel about that? And he just pauses and he gets that little John Oliver grin in his face. And he goes, because there's a new manager coming in. And he says, how do you feel about this new manager with the old one leaving? And he goes, 
you're not my dad. You're not my dad. That was my dad. And my dad's not. Today's sermon title is called, You're Not My Dad. Touch your neighbor and say, you're not my dad. Unless uh, he is your dad. And then that's weird. Say, you are my dad. Uh, this sermon is called, You're Not My Dad. Um, Nehemiah is somebody that God sends to you to help um, build a wall around your life, around something in your life, and keep the blessings of God uh, there, rather than letting it bleed out. Now, um, anybody, um, any, is anybody here the oldest uh, in the family? So I'm the eldest in the family. Um, all you other people without your hands in the air, um, we had bedtimes. We had rules. And then, uh, then you broke mom and dad. And uh, you grew up with a life with, like, you thought you grew up with your best friends. And uh, we grew up with parents. And so, um, so but, but as the oldest, sometimes I would um, influence my brother in ways that probably weren't that healthy. My brother's name was Ryan. He was just here visiting. And I'm always making fun of Ryan. He's always making fun of me. It's just kind of our dynamic in the family. We're kind of a competitive sort of a family. But one time, um, I remember we lived in Los Angeles in Pasadena. California. And uh, we had sprinklers in the yards, but they weren't the ones that pop up. They were the ones that stayed there that you got to trip and break your ankles on. And so they went like, (laughs) do we know what you, you watch TV, right though? Okay. So there were those types of sprinklers. And I had this idea one day, I was inspired probably by the Lord. I had this idea that I'm like, it's hot. All these cars are driving by and they look hot too. And maybe we should Right? So it's just a really short step in there. And so, but the trouble was uh, the valves were turned on in the relative safety of the porch with this like metal rod that you open the valve up with. And so that's what I decided was my job. And then I needed an expendable foot soldier, which are what little brothers are for. And I'm like, hey, Ryan, get out there and aim that sprinkler and get the cars going by. So Ryan's out there in the yard and we tried a few and we kind of, you know, it takes a little while to dial it in, cal- calibrate that. And then we got it just right, just right when a convertible goes by. We just all the way down, just boom, 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 boom. Now, um, if you have boys, that's as far as the planning goes, is that moment. And then, then we haven't thought about anything after that. We haven't thought about being murdered by a guy in a convertible. Uh, and so this convertible screeches on, backs up the street, and we're just like, oh my goodness. And we both panicked. Um, I was already in the porch, so I was closer. Uh, I ran through the house and up the tree in the backyard. And this is back in the day when, again, my parents weren't my best friends. And I stayed in that tree all evening. They were content with that. And uh, my brother went and, and hid under his bed in his bedroom. And so all of this would have been better if my parents weren't having a Bible study at the time. And they were. And then they hear this knock on the door. And so that would explain a lot of my uh, growing up. Uh, and so the, the influencing of my brother, a voice in his ear that probably led him down a path. And then sometimes I would feel like dad wasn't disciplining him enough and um, I would help. And then my dad would help me because he didn't need my help. Uh, the sermon, you're going to like that. You're going to, I think you'll like the sermon. But sometimes God is like, I don't need your help parenting. Um, I'm, I'm the dad, let me do the work and, and uh, let me be the voice in your brother's ear rather than, than your voice. Now, I'm, I'm preaching about something, so you're going to feel a little bit of heat from this because I'm preaching about something that in my own life I've fallen for and I think we've all fallen for this trap that the enemy uh, lays out for us. I, I think that as, a, as humans we're, we're pretty arrogant. We think like, oh, I'm a good chap to do something stupid. I'm like... That statement is something stupid that you got trapped in. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And I know that your dad and mom told you that you were special. But, and you are. You were the only one like you in that family. But there's a million people on earth that think like you do. And that you would be like, oh, we have a similar... Now, you are unique in the sight of God. But your, your painting on God's fridge isn't there because it's a good painting. It's not, he's not like, oh, that's super talented. See, I've got all these... I've got... All these famous painters, and then I've got you. I got Ludovic's painting, and here's, he's just like framed it up there. He's like, "Oh yeah, this is no, no." He, he's it's up there because he likes Ludovic, and God is like that. You are special. Uh, you are special to the Lord, but you're also easily trappable for the enemy. And I've been trapped by this before, and I, I know what it feels like, so I get it. 
uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. I also hate losing. So I remember what it feels like when I got trapped and tricked. And so the heat that I'm going to preach this with is so that I don't want you to have to go through what I went through. Now, some of you are going through it right now. And so this is going to help, help your life. Okay, so this is what I'm preaching about today is that God is a creator and sends Nehemiah, sends the word of Nehemiah, it might be your small group leader, it might be your mom, like a voice of God to your life. And God sends a Nehemiah. Now the devil is not a creator. God created everything from scratch, from nothing. The devil can't create, he can only consort. So what the enemy does, when God sends a Nehemiah to build a wall, the enemy will send a, are you ready? A false Nehemiah, a fake Nehemiah. He will try to hijack the voice of, of God, that God is going to fit somebody into your life that is going to speak that thing, that's going to set your marriage free. And, and the enemy will send you another voice with a counterfeit, a fake Nehemiah to try to, because this is the, the work of Nehemiah is to teach people how to build a wall. So Teaching. Now think about the role of teacher. That's all that we're talking about today is that when you send your kid to school, your math teacher is supposed to be teaching them math because they don't know yet. And so this is the role of Nehemiah. Now, um, this real Nehemiah that God sends to you will build things in your life. Simplify things, build things, build walls around your family, around your relationships, uh, around your finances. Now, false Nehemiahs, what the enemy will use is he'll get them to teach you how to tear walls down. So the false Nehemiahs will actually tear down your commitments to the right things eventually. They will, they will actually second guess commitment and sacrifice and following your leaders. And, and see, the false Nehemiahs have deserted their post on the wall. They want you to desert your post on the wall as well. But as the minute that you desert your post on the wall that God wants you to stand on and defend, somebody behind you on that wall is going to suffer. So your life is not just about you. If you don't get this right, your neighbor might not get adopted into the family of God or find the freedom that they need because God wants to use you to do it. So the enemy's always trying to subvert this. Now, the Sanballats, they're the, the enemies that are, that are in our story. So there's Nehemiah, then there's Sanballat. Sanballat are the reason that your finances aren't doing well. Because you're following another voice that has jacked itself into your ears and does that make, it's like spend it on that like think about your career they're the reason that you're not happy at work right now there's always somebody at work who's like just complains about everything all the time they could have the best job on the planet and they would complain about it and you got somebody at your work who's like that somebody who's who's unhappy, who doesn't really get how, how godly marriage is spoken to work, and they're whispering in your ear when you're interacting with your spouse. And there's this weird sense of obligation to the wrong fake Nehemiah. It's the weirdest thing that you want them to like you. There's something attractive about them. There's something that's just like pulling you and drawing them. Like... You want to parent the way that they want you to parent, but they don't have kids. Or they don't have kids that you want. But there's this weird pull, and here's what I think. I, I was writing, the Holy Spirit was showing me this just this morning, is that there's something that they speak deep inside of you that you like, and it pulls you in. They speak to your flesh. The Bible says you're not to be people of the flesh, not doing what your body wants you to do and command all the time. All of the, the sexual confusion out there right now is because, hey, just do whatever you want. It'll make you feel good. It was like for a moment. That's how addictions and drugs work too. But it's not according to design the way that God has this investment plan for you. So you are supposed to be people of the spirit, not people of the flesh. There's something that they speak that attracts you right there. And then there's this weird sense of obligation that you have, but they're not your dad. The funny thing is, my real dad, if he was good with me, I didn't need to, I didn't care what anybody else's dad thought about me. I didn't care about what anybody at school thought about me. And some of us, we're living our lives to please people, but we're not living our lives in a way that pleases God. Because when you please God, he'll sort the people out. But some of the people we're hanging out with, we're not hanging out with our dad. So. Now, Sam Bella, in your life, has to character assassinate Nehemiah, which we're going to read about here in a second. They have to character assassinate 
them. Now, here's a false belief that we're going to fix. Uh, we've come through the series. If you're coming in uh, cold to this one, you need to go back and, um, and watch the other three. But the first uh, false belief we fix are that people are the problem. People are not the problem. The devil is the problem. He just tricked people. And uh, people have hurt you. Yeah, it was the devil who hurt you, who tricked the people to hurt you. So let's stop being angry at people and getting pointed at people. Let's concentrate on the real enemy. The second thing is that broken people can fix broken people problems. Now, this is when uh, husbands and wives are trying to fix each other constantly. You're broken. Let's let the Lord fix the other person. Broken people can't fix broken people problems. He might use you to, to do something in their lives, but you can't fix them. Leave it to the Lord. Here's the third thing. I choose where I fit. False belief. Now, let the Lord fit you. You'll never be happy until he's fit you into the puzzle the way, place that he wants you. Now, here's our false belief today. You ready? I am obligated to hear out fake Nehemiah. I am, we're Canadians, I am obligated to hear them out. Well, it doesn't hurt to listen. I'm telling you. I'm obligated to hear out fake Nehemiah and see what they have to say. It's the same thing that Eve said in the garden. I am obligated to hear out the serpent. I'm obligated to hear out this other hijacked voice. And, and the devil hasn't really changed his, his tactic ever since. We had a voice when, when Pastor Aaron and I were dating in our lives. We had so many good voices that were speaking the words of God over us, uh, our parents, um, our church family. Now, mom and dad were our pastors. My mom and dad were our pastors. We don't have the same mom and dad. <laughs> Just to be clear. Um, but my mom and dad were our pastors, so they were also my, my parents in that role. As, a, as parents, they thought that God was calling us, us, or God was calling us to be married to each other. Um, as pastors of our church leadership team, all on board, you know, that's, it's important. You need the support of your church family. You also need God's voice in it because they might keep you from marrying the wrong person. But it was all, all systems go until her friend came back from university. Now, Pastor Aaron was super close with his friend for a long time. She was uh, at one time a very, very strong Christian uh, leader, actually. And so, but she came back and she took an instant disliking to me, which I know you're just like, what? You? And I'm like, I don't get it. She, she actually would read scriptures to Pastor Aaron and read scriptures about the fruit of the Spirit and say like, and list them off and be like, I don't, I don't see this in Corey's life. Like, I don't see patience. And I'm like, that's not even a real fruit of the Spirit. Is that, why is that in there? Is that, that's not the same as all the other ones, though. And like she had a pretty valid argument about some of them. I'm not going to lie. Maybe even today. But it's like this other voice started coming in. And really the enemy was using this voice. I would say a Christian voice to try to subvert what God wanted to do. And so we had our Nehemiahs in, in our lives speaking the words of God to us. But then we had another person who was self-appointing them, you know, self-appointing as that voice from God who was using scripture to actually subvert what God wants. Now, are you guys glad that we got married? Yeah. Like, I mean, this is like, we've had our struggles, but we were supposed to be with each other. So, but this other voice, and then, then she starts going around to Aaron's friends in Calgary. And this is also what happens is that, is that what was once clear becomes confused and distorted. And her friends start listening to this other voice and questioning, questioning, questioning this other voice as if she had the right to do that. And start questioning, and then, and so this is all happening before we get married. Now, this is a confusing time. This is a super confusing time in our lives. And so I'm sitting at the kitchen table with my mom and, uh, and Aaron. We're sitting there, and we're, I'm telling the story of this other person. And then my, my dad walks in. So Pastor Richard, our pastor, walks in to, the, my, to my mom's kitchen table. Walks in and says, what's, what's going on? And I give him the Cope 30-second uh, version. There's a 30-second version of the story that you're living in right now, by the way. <laughs> so I gave him the 30-second version uh, of, like, well, this, you know, single friend of Aaron's feels like we're not supposed to get married and feels like she has God's revelation for this. And, and my, my dad, we're coming in from all this drama, and my dad goes, huh, that's about right, and walks out of the room. <laughs> that's the last thing he ever said about it. I haven't heard anything more about it. That's it. You know what it did? It calmed us down. It just went... Stay on task here. God's already spoken. 
All of this other stuff is fluff and drama. What it did was it actually pruned some of those friendships that we didn't need moving forward. But then, I mean, it was confusing because she was supposed to be uh, Pastor Ann's maid of honor. And she got herself uninvited. And then, and then she spent the week before with Pastor Ann's uh, bridesmaid, spent a week before talking trash about us to the bridesmaid. And we had to sit down with the bridesmaid and say, like, you got to decide. Like, are you with us or not? Is this God or not? Or is this other voice trying to hijack? Now, that's what the enemy really wants to do. Now, they want to hijack the role of, of teacher in your life. Now, real Nehemiahs recommend obedience. False Nehemiahs recommend, you ready? Reasoning. Just go back to the, the Garden of Eden. Reasoning. Hey, you're smart. You're smart. You're smart like that person. You know what they know about the Bible? Yeah, that's not the same thing as God calling somebody and setting that person in place and saying, no, no, you need to help this person. You need to correct. You need to tell them that's not how math works. And the, the enemy will start whispering into, into your ear in this flattering uh, sort of a thing. So real ne- Nehemiahs recommend obedience. They're just like, just obey what God told you to do. We'll help you. Um, false Nehemiahs recommend reasoning. Like, um, real Nehemiahs is short and sweet. Like, this is Nehemiah's message to the people. Build the wall and the disgrace. Like, you're tired of them coming and doing stuff to your kids? Build the wall and the disgrace. We got to go now. False Nehemiahs, they want to engage you in a long conversation, a long running conversation. They want to, um, it, it's not really, they're just being used by the enemy to, to this. It starts with a little bit of flattery. Like, hey, you're smart. You're called by God. You're gifted. It, it goes into a little bit of independence. Hey, you don't really need that. No, you don't have to do what anybody says. You don't, it's just you and Jesus. You know who doesn't say that? Jesus. Jesus never said, it's just you and me, dude. He's like, I have placed members in the body. I have given teachers. I have given. I have given. I gave parents. I gave. No, no, no. I've given you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you after wisdom. So you don't get to say that because Jesus never said that. He's like, no, I work through my body. They're my hands and feet. Then what happens is it starts creating confusion. Confusion. Then it creates brokenness because we stop obeying the voice of the Lord and then it creates bitterness. And that bitterness that that the false Nehemiah wants to create in the story, Sanballat wants to create towards Nehemiah, that bitterness actually, if, if you listen to the false Nehemiah, will actually create a bitterness against God himself one day. Now here's the problem. And then it goes into these because then it always ends up with the control questions. So do you know what a control question is? When your teenager is like, you're not the boss of me. Control question. Did God really say that? Well, hold on. Did God really say that? Eve in the garden? Did God really say that you're not supposed to eat from that tree that will kill you? Yeah, he did. A better question is, why is there a snake in the garden? This is supposed to be a paradise garden. Snakes. Kill them. Cats. No, too far. (laughs) This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to create division in your mind. Division. That's what happens when you have more than one vision. Division. Division. The Bible says a house divided falls. If the enemy can divide you in your own mind and in your own heart, he's got you. He'll leave you alone for a bit, but he can come and take you anytime because you won't have any support. You won't have a wall around yourself. And he will come. At first, he just likes it when you're a little bit miserable and confused. Eventually, he will come and destroy your life and take everything that you love away from you. Now, everybody in the room, think of that person in your life that before that person, you actually had a clear path. Before that person was hired, before you started hanging out with that person, it actually was pretty clear. You were actually moving forward with God. It was hard. But it was clear and clean. It felt good. There was something about it like you were moving forward. You weren't. And then after this person's influence in my life, I start getting confused and start questioning things that I shouldn't question and start wondering about things that God never wanted me to wonder about. And rather than just take God at his word, I start questioning God and his word. I start questioning the motives of God. I start questioning the motives of the people that God has sent my way. Um, and, And so think about that person. Because the Bible says this, you shall know them by their fruit. 
not by their arguments. There's all sorts of crazy arguments that will, you shall know them by their fruit. So the devil has a, you ready? A narrow window of time that you fell into last time. And here's the, the window of time, is that you shall know them by their fruits, meaning you haven't seen the fruit of their words yet because they're sowing those words. You haven't seen the fruit in their own lives yet. This is when people with three-year-olds want to lecture me about parenting, but I got 21-year-old. Don't brag like you know yet. When you're 15, everybody will know if you knew what you were doing when they were two. There's a period of time. It's like the germination of the seed that you haven't seen yet in the fake Nehemiah, in their life and in their family and in everything in their connection with God and their purpose, you haven't, it hasn't had time to fulfill itself yet. And if you can start sowing bad seeds in this moment, by the time that you realize you're caught, you won't even think that you are anymore. I've, confessions of a pastor's kid. I've just watched this happen so many times. I've watched it happen to myself. But good news, guys, I hate losing. I remember what it feels like. So you don't have to go for it. You can learn from this if you want to. Now, um, Have you ever challenged the character of an authority figure in somebody else's life? You know, subconsciously we do this because we don't want to do what we're told either. Right? Is this not working for you? But what right did you have to say that? What right did your neighbor have to come and tell your kid that they don't have to listen to mom about that? What right does a, ready? A school teacher have to tell your kid how God made them. There's other voices trying to get in there with other agendas that God's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not their responsibility. That's not their right. I didn't give them any revelation about that. I'm not going to back that up. That is good. Thank you, Arwen, my daughter. <laughs> the devil wants to do two things. He wants you to follow a fake Nehemiah so that one day you can be a fake Nehemiah. And some of us are actually acting that role uh, towards our children. Can I say this? Uh, Christian parents of my day were awful at this. They were terrible at this. Um, my parents were great, but most of my friends grew up. Their, their, their parents would make moral issues of everything that the Bible hadn't made a moral issue about. Then they would say, like, God hates sarcasm. And that's hard for me. Because I think I read the Bible and I'm like, I feel like God is a bit sarcastic. I don't mean mean and cruel. I mean, he's like, sometimes like, seriously, dude, you thought that was a good idea? You know, God has a sense of humor. He's like, he's not above poking fun at you for being dumb. Sometimes like, come on, guys, we could do better than this. But I mean, all these things that we would say and they play a moral card of like, well, this is what God, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know what's, har what's harder than making moral issues of things that aren't moral issues? Parenting. Parent your kids. Spend time with them. Tell them why you don't want them to make the mistakes you made. Like actually take the time to show like cause and effect. This is how, this is the fruit of that decision, but it takes time. That's why I don't want you doing that. Now stop getting distracted and distracted pe and getting people distracted and off the wall and off of our mission. Sanballat was very angry when he learned we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews. Now watch the tone here because Nehemiah is coming in. He's building. He's const constructive. He's hard, but he's building. Now the mockery sort of starts on this other side of things. He mocked the Jews saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? So it eventually degrades, watch this, it eventually, that other voice eventually degrades people who are building. Degrades, it's the difference between, and they always call themselves critical thinkers, but they're not, they're just critical. Because critics never built anything. Critical thinking, they, if it's critical thinking, they would know that they're going to reap what they sow one day. That's critical thinking, but they're not critical thinking. They're just critical. They just, they just don't like it that somebody else is building something that they're not building. So do they think they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Did anybody say they were going to build it in a day? No. A wall around Jerusalem? Yeah. Did Nehemiah promise that? No. Where do they get this from? Watch the exaggeration. Nobody said that. Nobody thought that. Nobody promised that. God didn't promise it. Nobody promised it. Nobody, they just made it, right? And then it said, by just offering a few sacrifices. I've been wondering all week, why is that in there? Because every religion back then, these guys sacrificed to their gods. 
by just offering a few sacrifices. Then I realized, yeah, that fake Nehemiah always goes after the sacrifices that you would make to God. Sacrificing your time and resources to build the kingdom of God. Always go after it. Here's how I know there's a fake Nehemiah. Ready? They always go after tithing. Tithing means giving a tenth of your income to God. God's like, hey, if you do this, guys, I will do all of this for you. I'll make sure that everything stretches further than, the 90% always stretches further than the 100% anyways. And I'm going to protect your children. I'm going to take this out of your path. I'm going to do this. I'm going to rebuke the devil for you. Oh, you can't do that? Oh, God can do that. He's like, but I need you to invest in your own future so I can bless you. Right? And so, but, but fake name eyes always go after tithing. Always. Because they don't tithe. Because they're too cheap to give any money back to the God who saved them when they had nothing so that they can adopt one more child because they don't do it. So every false name I that I've ever heard who calls themselves a Christian doesn't tithe. And they always got to go after the sacrifices. Like, why do you do that? Of course they don't like that you don't like do all the things and party with them anymore and you go to church. Of course they hate that. You're investing in something that matters. Stay and build a wall. Do they actually think? They said that they could make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charge ones of that. So by the Ammonite who was standing beside him, they always got a bestie who's like, remark, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. I'm like, shut up, dude, a fox? What are you, what? You didn't build anything better than the wall you built, which was no wall. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and the rest of our enemies, are you ready? This is where it gets super interesting found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. Oh, thank God for your small group leader, for your venue kids teacher, so that no gaps remain in your child's life. No, 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 we got to get all the wall built. Though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So they sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Every preacher's favorite. Hey, can you come meet us at Ono? Like, that's... Like, do you want to swim in, in bloodbath lake? <laughs> you want to go swim in bloodbath? You want to hike Murder Mountain? <laughs> it's beautiful out this time of year. Are there many murders there? Oh, yeah, people get murdered there all the time. We should go for a hike. I can go all day, guys. We should eat at the diarrhea den. <laughs> Don't eat there! Like, let's meet at the Plains of Ono. It's like, oh, no! That sounds like a terrible idea. So right there, thank you, Lord, for giving me that village name that in English makes sense to me. Let's fly with Safety Last Airlines. We'll get you there on time or not at all. Now, this is one of the defining moments in a leader's life is because Nehemiah has to confront fake Nehemiah. Now, this is how he does it, though. Watch it. He doesn't do it the way that fake Nehemiah wants him to. He says, I'm engaged in a great work. I can't come. Why should I start working to come and meet with you? You're not building anything. You're tearing this down. Why should I stop what God told me to do to come and talk to you about something you don't want to do? Four times they sent the same message. Each time I gave the same reply. It's not getting any more complicated than this. I'm building a wall. I can't do it. We're building stuff. Yeah. Now, the fifth time, Sanballat's servant came with an open Facebook post in his hand. <laughs> Are you ready? Come on, Canada. Laugh so they don't think it's you. <laughs> and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations. And Geshem tells me it's true. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. You know, to a pastor, you know what that means? And all my friends, it means that they are the only one that thinks that. They're desperately trying to talk other people into thinking that. And their husband has to think that so that he doesn't sleep on the couch forever. Yeah. And the sympathizer families. Pastor Peter... Pastor Peter says, there's always four sympathizer families. It was like, well, we like them. We don't really agree with what they're saying, but I guess we should. Oh, false belief, hearing out of. Now listen, that you and the Jews, this is the rumor, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. Oh, look at that. Isn't that funny? Plan to be their king. Nehemiah came from the king. You don't want to be a king. Why did they say that? Why did, why did they say that? Because that's what they wanted. It's called projecting. I'm projecting on you what's in my heart. I think you're guilty of that because I am, but I don't want to say it. I don't even know it. Why do your teenager, has your teenager ever called you controlling? 
Does nobody in the room have teenagers? Are they sitting here and you're afraid of them? Have they ever called you controlling? Right. I'm a controlling person. I decided because I'm controlling that I'm going to have teenagers. Because they're super easy to control. This is great. What a great decision. I'm going to control a bunch of teenagers. I'm going to parent teenagers. Let's do that. Let's do that so that my life can be simpler. No, no, no. They're saying that because they want control. Here's how controlling my dad was. If you want to live with the neighbors, live with the neighbors. If you want to live here, there's a bedtime for the older kid. <laughs> you got to take the trash out. There's rules here that keep us all together and working as a family. So go to the neighbors if you want ice cream and want to get sick. But hey, you're welcome to come home. But around here, that's how controlling my dad was. Like live here, live with the neighbors. You call it. Calls child services if you don't like it around here. If you think that there's better parents, go for it. This is how controlling Pastor Aaron and I are as pastors. Are you ready? Go someplace else. If you don't like what God is doing here, go someplace else. We're not trying to make everybody happy. We're trying to make God happy and trying to reach people. We're building a wall. So if you don't like that, if it's something you don't like, go to a different church. There's great churches in town. I have friends. I'll send you to one. That's how controlling it. I'm not trying to keep anybody. Right in our, you know, right in our venue code, our church is specifically designed around our vision. It might not be for everybody. We're okay with that. That's on the website. So, like, listen, we'll teach you the word of God. You can do it if you want to live and be blessed. But God himself won't control you. God himself won't make up your mind for you. It's like, do this and live or do this and die. Go follow your fake dad if that's what you want to do. There's no life out there, though. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there's a king in Judah. You can be very sure this report will get back to the king. So I suggest you come and talk it over with me. He's like, I just came from the king. Don't act like you have a relationship with the king. I just came from, I have the relationship with the king. I got the signed letters from the king. Nehemiah's like, send it. Maybe he'll send an army your way. Watch. I replied, Nehemiah says, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to, this is what the devil wants to do, intimidate us. Imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. It's funny when I listen to those fake voices. It's discouraging. It's intimidating. It's not the voice of God. It's not that building, that clean voice. And then Nehemiah says, he passes the test. He says, so I continued the work with even greater determination. They're not going to stop what God is doing. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we'd begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, ready? They were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our Nehemiah. Oh, sorry. God. Right, right. Re Nehemiah in your life doesn't... He's not trying to get the glory. She's not trying to get the glory. She's just obeying the Lord with the help of our God. He's like, they got it. They got it. All of this is about the Lord and what the Lord is doing in your life. Now, my dad used to smoke a lot. What's hilarious to me is that they're smoking advisories on movies now. Like that's part of the parental guidance is that people might be smoking. You don't think that's funny? I think that's hilarious. I'm like, yeah, we know that it causes, yeah, they're like, we get it. Smoking. My dad used to smoke a lot back in the day, and I asked him, how did you, how did you stop? And he says, I just quit. My mom, my mom said, it, it was harder than that. <laughs> but he did. He did. Now, he tried to quit. I don't know how many times he tried to quit, but he quit. Maybe it was just the one time. I feel like it was maybe more, but that but he goes I quit and I thought some of us have been smoking I'm not saying anything about smoking I'm just saying some of us have been listening to addicted to the false Nehemiah some of you some of y'all are on social and you are the the enemy is literally pointing you at people that already agree with you and all you're doing is feeding yourself with fake shepherds that aren't there for your marriage. And like, they literally aren't there to be like, dude, you gotta start talking nice to your wife. They're never gonna tell you something that disagrees with you because they're not your shepherds, they're not your leaders, they're not the people that God has sent you to do life with who are gonna be there for you when your child does something real stupid and give you hope and love your children. And I think, I think 
that you need to maybe, my dad cold turkey smoking, and I think you need to cold turkey, fake Nehemiah's. 52 days. 52 days. Look at a calendar and be like, 52 days from now. 52 days. That doesn't mean you hate anybody. You got to forgive. You got to let go. That doesn't mean that you just, you just like cold shoulder. That doesn't mean any of that. It just means like cold turkey that voice. Hey, we're not talking about this anymore. Cold turkey that voice. In 52 days, I'll bet you God could build a wall around something that the devil is tearing down right now before you have to reap the rewards of what that actually looks like in your life. I feel like there's a grace period for you, and I feel like it's 52 days. Father, we, we need to apologize to our Lord because other people have tried to take the voice of our Father in our lives, and you've spoken to some to do that, but not everybody. And, and uh, sooner or later, you stop speaking, and we start getting very distant from the Lord and very discouraged and very confused and divided. And we are sorry, Lord. Send us your messengers again. We repent. We turn our ears only to the Lord and those you have sent. And uh, those who would command obedience from us to the Lord, so the Lord can bless us. As, as we're praying, just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Somebody here, I feel like, your dad, look, your dad was a great guy, but he had a funny false voice about God to you. And he trained you and taught you some bad things that you need to unlearn about God. Or the church, you know, the church. I grew up with trades people and the church always wants your money that's what they'd always say i'm like you've never been to church but there's a voice of like it's questioning god's right to rule questioning god's right to lead and provide for us and love us and partner with us in our lives and father uh for every person here that that is realizing i've been listening to false nehemiahs about that i need i need a real dad i've been i've had this other i've had the enemy and that's not my real dad i if that's you and you need to, like, you want to come to Jesus, you want to meet Jesus right here and right now, I just want you to do something that nobody's looking at you, I'm looking out, that's it. Just raise your, slip your hand in the air. I just want to see you and just recognize, like, hey, I want to meet Jesus. I actually want God to adopt me into his family right here. I see you right here, right now. I see you. Thank you. It takes courage to put your hand up. I get it. I get it. We're going to show you how to connect in a minute. But can we just pray this? If that's you, just put your hand in the air. Can we pray this prayer uh, after me? Ben, you help, let's help them out a little bit. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We realize our sin have kept us from a holy God. We realize the enemy is our father. And we want you to be our father. Would you forgive us our sins? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you speak to us in the name of Jesus? Amen.